Okay. Welcome everyone uh, to this very special June um, fireside chat with the Turing Way, which itself is hosted by the Alan Turing Institute, um, the UK's National Institute for Data Science and AI. Um, my name is Anne Lee Steele. I am the community manager of the Turing Way project. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm an East Asian woman uh, with short brown hair wearing a black short, short sleeve shirt. And my background is blurred, but it features many plants. Um, I'm really excited to be with you all today to uh, learn more from the speakers we have here um, on this topic. And to get us started, I'll share a little bit more about what we'll be speaking about today, um, what we'll be learning from folks here about. Um, I'll share a little bit more about the Turing Way project, and then I'll pass the, the mic to Alejandro and Carlos, who will be co-facilitating this conversation, and then on to Shannon and, and Loic and Claire uh, to share more about themselves. And so for those of you that are joining for the first time, um, the Turing Way is an open source uh, community that documents, maintains, and translates best practices in data science and AI. And we're an open collaboration whose goal is to make reproducible, ethical, and collaborative data science accessible and comprehensible for everyone. And we do this by creating resources, facilitating events, um, and stewarding community practices that bring perspectives from folks, countries, backgrounds, disciplines, languages, and lived experiences. And this Fireside Chat series, um, which was started in 2021, is an effort to create a space where people can gather to, to ask questions, to exchange concerns, explore challenges, and share different practices that work in their context with the aim of bridging across difference. And this month we'll be focusing on the intersection between computation, climate, and culture. Um, and we'll try to use these three lenses to understand how sustainability is talked about, mobilized around and utilized by six very different actors in this space um, who I'm really excited to learn from today. And while it is undeniable that we're approaching or have already reached um, a climate reckoning, um, we've seen in reaction to this, a number of initiatives emerge in the academy and belong and beyond as awareness of climate change has become all the more present and urgent. But while this kind of collective emergence of these initiatives has signified both a critical mass and a collective sense of urgency, it's also shown how different these initiatives can be, um, ranging from critiques of data and natural resource extraction, understanding the climate cost and the karmic cost, carbon cost of work, developing technical solutions in support of sustainable development and much, much, much more. Um, and today, the folks that we've gathered here kind of sit across all these different intersections and are keen to ask how they think about and work around climate change and sustainability, how they diverge, where they converge, and even what sustains them. Um, this conversation is hosted or, or co-hosted and co-facilitated by Alejandro Coca Castro of the Environmental Data Science Book and Carlos Martinez Ortiz of the Netherlands eScience Center. And we're joined by Claire Buckley of Julie's Bicycle, Loic Lanilog from Green Algorithms um, from the University of Cambridge, Shannon Dos Magan from the Open Environmental Data Science uh, Data Project, um, and Pasek from Low Carbon Research Methods. Um, my colleague Alexandra Araujo Alvarez also helped to co-design this conversation alongside our speakers themselves. Um, I will share the link one more time to our uh, shared pad and document here where we really aim to facilitate shared note-taking and invite for you to join in to the conversation as well. And we do have a code of conduct here um, that applies to this event to ensure accessibility and respectful collaboration. If you have any concerns or you'd like to report an incident that makes you feel uncomfortable at this call or have other ideas to improve our accessibility as a project and as a community and in these events, um, please email theturingway at gmail.com or you can reach out directly to myself or to um, Malvika Sharon, who is the co-lead of the project, um, by emailing our, our um, Turing emails, which the information of which is in the shared etherpad. So with all of those logistical um, introductions and more information about today, I'm really delighted to hand over the mic to Alejandro and to Carlos to kick us off. Thank you all so much for joining. Hello, everyone online. Thank you, Anne. And Alejandro, uh, my pronouns are he, him, I am Latino in my mid-30s and wearing a dark blue t-shirt with a 
a street letter A, and my background is just <laughs> some uh, divider below, like white divider. Uh, I, I work for the Alan Turing Institute and research fellow focused on applying AI and data science for environmental and climate research. At the Turing, we have a strategic vision in 2.0 that we call and, and also contributing to a grand challenge in environmental sustainability. Very, very happy to, to be here and also as well the founder of the Environmental Data Science Book, a computational community for open environmental science, apart from the mission of educating and leveraging good practices in software and data management in this community. EDS Book promotes a more collaborative, ethical and responsible environmental research. So that's why we are co-hosting this call. And uh, with this being said, it's my huge pri privilege to be able to co-facilitate co the discussion with uh, Dr. Carlos Martinez Ortiz, who I would like now he to introduce and uh, uh, introduce as well his project. Now, Carlos. Uh, hi, thanks, Alejandro. Uh, yeah, my name is Carlos Martinez. Uh, I work at the Netherlands Sea Science Center uh, based in the Netherlands. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. And uh, I'm wearing a green shirt with a blur background. Um, so uh, uh, really, um, the, the Netherlands Sea Science Center, we're the national center of expertise in the research software. So we uh, work a lot on developing research software. And we've recently been uh, involved in different conversations about the impact of compute in general uh, in, in the environment. Uh, so. Actually, I, I got involved by uh, uh, by the Turing Way by working on an issue on uh, providing some guidance for re for researchers on the environmental uh, raising awareness about the environmental impact of compute uh, of research computing. Uh, I'll share the link uh, to that issue in, in, on, in the chat in a moment. Uh, so uh, it is still an ongoing issue. So any co uh, contribute contributions to the, those issues to that issue would still be very welcome. Uh, but um, so that's a little bit my interest in, in this uh, topic, uh, but I would actually really like to hear more from, uh, from our speakers. So if I will now give, give the floor to each of our um, speakers uh, and just uh, please uh, introduce your name, uh, introduce yourself, just tell us about your, your affiliations and tell us about your journey that has led you to, uh, to be interested in these climate issues. So how did you get involved in your current projects? And, uh, and all of that. And if maybe we can start uh, with Claire. Sure. Thanks, Carlos. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Claire Buckley. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a white middle aged woman with medium length dark hair, wearing a brightly colored top with a really boring brick wall behind me. Um, so I lead on programs and projects at Julie's Bicycle, which is a not-for-profit which works to mobilize the cultural and creative community to act on the climate, nature and justice crisis. I've been working in the environmental field for over 25 years, and I first got interested in it um, when I was in the final year of a degree in marketing and languages thanks to um, a fantastic class I took on social movements and the ecology movement in France. And also thanks to the realization that marketing really wasn't my thing. So I left Ireland um, and I went to do a European master's in environmental management because there was just no option to do anything like that in Ireland at the time. And it was most definitely one of the best decisions I have ever made. Since then, I've been working to build environmental understanding and action. I've worked in different countries with different cultures, sectors, and organizations. And in 2012, I joined Julie's Bicycle, and this is where I have really come to truly appreciate the power of culture and creativity. So I am definitely not a scientist. I am definitely not a data scientist. I'm also probably one of the least tech and digital savvy people of the Julie's Bicycle team. And I do sometimes question the extent to which tech and data and digital really improve our lives, in particular when I think about the imbalance in terms of who programs, who codes, what data is used for and who really benefits. We recently did a, a team session on AI as we're all trying to understand it better and its implications in particular for culture. 
And I have to tell you that one of my main thoughts was what if all or even some of the money and the brain power which has gone into AI had gone into things like clean energy, clean transport, green spaces, affordable, low impact housing. There is a lot of data, there is a lot of science, there is a lot of computation. What there is not enough of is action and change is definitely too slow. What I can say is that data and computation is a really important part of what we do at Chile's Bicycle. And throughout our work, we aim to use data to inform action and to evidence change as part of a broader program of work. Since we first began 16 years ago, our work has been guided by a deep respect for science, data and expertise. We regularly work with data experts and scientists, for example, from the Environmental Change Institute at Oxford University to the Computer Science Department at Bristol University. 14 years ago, we created a free online carbon calculator. It's very small in the grander scale of I AI and data science things, but it does help hundreds of organizations to build understanding, to inform action and to track progress. And it does help us to develop our insights into impacts and progress more broadly on a sector level. Most recently, we've had some modest investment in the tools. And I am really glad to say that since, since last year, we even have our own in-house digital expertise, which is really amazing. So I just wanted to share a few thoughts on, on where we are now um, in terms of data and evidence and the tools um, which we have. Over the last few years, we have seen a proliferation of different calculators and online tools. We are constantly being asked about our tools and our data. We've seen a really exciting coming together of creativity and data science with a range of artistic and creative visualizations of environmental data. We see a huge interest from the sector in understanding the impact of all things digital, but the complexity of the systems and the lack of transparency makes this really hard. We see a growing appetite to scale up data collection using online tools, but very often and too often the idea is that the tools and the data are the silver bullets when we know from experience they are a part of the puzzle and they need to be situated within a broad program of change across systems, practice, people, and policy. We absolutely know that we need more standardization in terms of our calculation and computational methodologies. This is a really hard sell from a funding perspective. We know that there is not an awful lot of solid publicly available environmental data for the creative industries. And this was really highlighted by the net zero research we did last year for the Creative Industries Policy and Evidence Center. And there's definitely a lack of appreciation of what it takes to get robust, meaningful environmental data for a sector as varied as the creative and cultural sector. And last but not least, what we also see is an absolute need to bridge the gap between the worlds of computation and culture and a huge opportunity in bringing these worlds closer together to not only build understanding, but crucially to build action. And there you go. That's a little bit of Thank you. Of an Thank intro. you, Claire. Yeah, that's, uh, that's fantastic. There's really interesting points you, you mentioned there. Uh, so, uh, before we jump into questions, let's be sure they're uh, introducing the speaker. So uh, I'll uh, give the now the floor to Shan, if that's okay. I want to uh, same just tell us about your uh, yourself and about your journey so far. Sure. Um, thanks for having me. And hello, everybody. My name is Shannon Dosmegan. I use pronouns she her. I'm wearing a brightly colored, I don't flowered shirt, um, and I am in a very generic. Washington DC hotel, imagine, you know, taupe blinds and a black TV on a wall. Um, so a uh, pleasure to be in conversation with everybody. Um, I am in, uh, or I'm usually, I'm in DC now, I'm usually in New Orleans, Louisiana in the United States. Um, and years and years and years ago, uh, I got some of my initial foundation and grounding for the work that I do now. 
um, when I was working with a, a small nonprofit uh, that um, focused on supporting what we call fence line communities um, in a region of Louisiana that we refer to as Cancer Alley. Uh, and so it's a, a part of the world where there is a high number of petrochemical refining facilities um, that sit along the Mississippi River. Um, and we would work with communities on setting up uh, community air monitoring programs, um, doing things like odor logging, um, thinking about different ways to document the experiences they were having living directly next to these refining facilities. Uh, and it was here that uh, even before we were using the term open science hardware or open hardware, um, that I first started working with um, what I would now consider to be an open hardware, uh, physical open hardware device. Um, so a, a low cost replication of an environmental protection agency, SUMA canister, um, which does uh, basically um, on spot grab air monitoring. Um, and it was a way, uh, you know, that communities could actively be involved in having a say about um, what they were smelling, what their bodies were experiencing, what their communities were experiencing. And I think the, the most important thing that I learned during this part of my career that I've always carried with me, uh, you know, as I've, I've gone forward, um, is the importance of socially situating data um, as a means to tell experience and story um, and to, to basically insert local knowledge and experience into, into an environmental situation. Sorry, it's more. Um, so going forward from there, um, I worked with an organization called Public Lab. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I'm having a, a choking moment. Um, I worked with an organization called Public Lab, and we did a number of activities, but basically we're interested in thinking about how we could use the tools of open science and data um, to do environmental monitoring. <clears throat> I'm going to pass on to another speaker. Can you give me a second? Sorry. And I will come back. I really apologize for that. Just have something yeah, that, that's okay, Shannon. No worries. It happens. It's horrible when it does. Uh, but while Shannon gets some something to drink and let's uh, go past, maybe uh, can we pass on to Anne? Okay, hi there, everybody. Um, thanks so much for being here, and I'm I'm really looking forward to learning from all the panelists. Uh, so my name is Anne Pasek. I use she/her pronouns, um, and I have a, a goofy asymmetrical brown haircut. Uh, and I'm coming to you from a, a book-lined room here in Canada. Um, and uh, my, my sort of entry point into this conversation has a couple of origin stories, but, but the one that I think would be useful to tell uh, would bring me back to finishing up my PhD dissertation. I, um, I, I do a lot of work in the humanities and social sciences uh, around a field called STS, or Science and Technology Studies. So I like to say that we, we study scientists. So I wrote a dissertation um, that was kind of a, a rough account of 30 years of people trying to communicate about carbon trying to make uh, you know, these really dry numbers charismatic, politically capacious, um, something that could uh, improve literacy and sort of mobilize people to action. And it was very much a 30-year history of failures, right? Like we don't have a lot of broad success in, in mobilizing public support um, for stuff like carbon footprints. Um, but I, I wanted to, to not just sort of be a critic of these efforts from afar. So I have an appendix in the dissertation where I attempt to sort of do a rough carbon footprint analysis of all the work that went into writing this document. Um, you know, I thought it would be a little bit interesting to, to give that a try, but I, I was not expecting that it would be overly revealing or useful. Um, but it was, uh, in part because overwhelmingly, 90% of the, the number that I found uh, came from aviation, um, flying to conferences, to field sites, and to archives. And so that sort of told me that, like, you know, there, there is this really clear signal here, right? Um, even if my numbers are, are off by some small degree, um, like, airplanes really matter in, in how this all gets adjudicated out. And so uh, that suggested to me that it was going to be really useful to make a kind of rough provisional distinction and to say, like, there's high carbon research, stuff that involves getting on an airplane, and there's low carbon research. And let's just say that's that's everything else. And... Um, from that kind of like crude analytic cut, um, I, I've launched this project of thinking about uh, methods for, for research and for research exchange that, that can help sort of puzzle and trouble through and find alternatives to 
um, what I take to be, you know, sort of uncritical high carbon norms uh, in academia and research practices today. Um, I think it's important to do this, uh, not only because of uh, the environmental impacts of research, um, but because of the ways that like methods are really, really constitutive, right? They, they help build worlds. Um, that's true in their contribution to climate change. They're building a world that's warming faster than uh, it should be. But it's also true like within the social community of research, right? Um, having it be the case that um, the people who uh, are in the most conferences, the people who can reach the most exciting data um, and field sites are those who have travel funding, good visas that allow quite a lot of mobility. Um, we might also say like minimal care work responsibilities at home that inhibit that mobility. Uh, it really does seem to be the case that there's this strong correlation between um, the carbon intensity of research and uh, a certain kind of high carbon subject who, who thrives there um, to the detriment of others, right? So part of the project of low carbon research methods is to think about that link between equity and environment in how we do research, and then also to sort of like be creative and, and find alternatives uh, that might sort of have that, that dual purpose of having uh, lower carbon outcomes and more equitable and inclusive ways of um, doing and sharing research. Um, so quite often uh, that ends up uh, looking like computers, right? Like uh, I've broadly advocated before that, you know, we need to sort of find intelligent, successful and creative ways of doing online conferencing. Um, and as I've mentioned to the organizers of the Turing Way, right? Like the, the sort of care through which these discussions are facilitated to me seems like a really strong example of, of what it looks like to, um, you know, approach research exchange as a kind of design problem where we can really lay out our ethics in how we, we gather as a community. And, you know, again, like the equity gains there, I think are, are important in, in sort of pondering and maybe also mobilizing towards, right? We often say in energy transition research that um, the opportunity to change the, the, the energy mix of the world is also an opportunity to redistribute who is advantaged, where power flows, um, literally and figuratively across our society. Um, so too within the research community, right? So I think the stakes of, of how we, we approach energy transition are really interesting, really high, and really point us towards coalitional forms of thinking. Um, I think it also is the case that it, it might allow us to um, make space for different kinds of knowledge production. So one example that I, I is really near and dear to my heart is that I, I run a conference called DIY Methods, where uh, instead of getting on airplanes and meeting in a hotel room or, um, you know, all meeting on Zoom and sort of staring at a screen for hours on end. Um, participants make zines about their research. So like little printed booklets that are often quite visually wonderful. Um, and those all get like shipped off in the mail. Uh, so, you know, it, it's an exciting provocation to me because it's a way of sort of bringing aesthetics into how we share research and finding um, new ways of, of, you know, talking about what we're certain about, what we're uncertain about, of, of sort of playing and, and being convivial with our readers rather than just kind of giving a flat conference presentation PowerPoint effect to the world. So I'm excited about those kind of creative possibilities um, that might obtain to low carbon research. Um, but I also, apropos of our discussion today, uh, want to trouble what has for, for a while in my research group, again, been this kind of unquestioning thought that like digital is the answer. Um, I, I think like almost unquestionably, uh, having a Zoom call is going to be demonstrably better than getting on a bunch of airplanes. Um, but it's also the case that, you know, as, as I'm sure we'll, we'll trouble across many thoughts today, right? large language models, um, generative AI, there, there are all these use cases that um, seem very, very important to a kind of valued vision of what the future of research will look like. Um, but we also know that will be a future where uh, heaps and heaps of compute needs to be built. Um, uh, maybe there's going to be an interesting discussion to be had about uh, the, the sort of epistemological trouble of counting digital carbon emissions. It's really quite vexed, I think, is um, Claire was pointing to. Um, I, I have a kind of like very crude and simple approach, which is that um, rather than trying to quantify the carbon footprint of a given action, 
I like to think about what we can do to ensure that there's one less data center that gets built and sort of have that infrastructural, does it happen or not, kind of counterfactual question be a guiding light. So I, I, I want to think with you uh, all together about what it would mean to have research norms and practices that ensure that less data centers are built in the future. Um, and I also, again, want to keep thinking about that question uh, as a conjoined one of climate and equity. So if we move towards a high carbon digital future where lots of people are, are um, publishing papers uh, that are, are novel in part because they are just throwing compute at a problem, it seems like that could really deepen, um, right? Like inequities that, that emerge along questions of resources. So maybe pay to publish in the future will look like pay to compute. And I think that's not a future that we want um, for the climate or uh, for our, our intellectual community. So um, I'm, I'm still very much on the outside looking in on these questions, but I'm really, really excited to have a discussion with you all about that. So I will leave it at there. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Uh, that's really interesting. I'm, I'm sure we'll touch more on, on that of, of visions of the future during the questions. Uh, but I think, Sh Shannon, you're feeling better now. So I am. Uh, I apologize. I'm, I've been tromping around in snow and rain for the last week in one of our national parks, and um, I think I'm just choking a little bit. So I will I'll do my best. Um, so I'm going to just keep going from where I landed. Um, I, and I think the important part, and I, I realize we're getting close on time, so I will try to be brief. Um, I ran an organization um, and uh, worked alongside an open community called Public Lab um, for a decade. Um, and the, the premise of Public Lab was um, to start thinking about ways that we could use open tools to uh, create further accessibility um, and the ways that people are doing environmental monitoring um, as part of their right to participate in environmental governance and decision making. Um, and that ranged everything from, you know, where I live in Louisiana, uh, mapping, doing aerial mapping of the 2010 BP oil disaster, um, to working alongside communities who were fighting back against uh, mountaintop removal, um, mining practices, uh, and a number of extractive um, activities around the world. Um, and you know, with with Public Lab, um, I think I I learned um, just so much about the power of open tools and um, what information can do for supporting people and becoming more activated and engaged. Um, you know, in uh, the ability to think uh, about policies that will work for their communities and um, you know information that will will get them to a decision. Um, that will be in benefit um, of the, the people that they care about. Uh, however, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, and I'm, now I'm talking and I'm switching over to um, specifically the U.S. context, though I do think it, uh, it, it certainly, um, there are many other places that experience things way worse than we do or in, you know, similar or in parallel uh, to what we do. But um, it is very, very difficult for uh, data that's collected by communities to be used in environmental uh, decision making and governance, especially when it comes to enforcement and compliance and um, thinking about uh, policy changes and standard setting. Um, so I, I in 2020, um, I became a fellow with the Shuttleworth Foundation, uh, which is a foundation that supported um, open leaders uh, and people who are using the practice of the practice and tools of open, um, you know, on a number of different topics. And I started working with Open Environmental Data Project, um, and really with the idea, you know, how can we de-silo uh, many of the spaces where um, we need to be collaboratively thinking about data? So whether that is data that is coming from communities. Um, in an attempt to be a part of our environmental governance and decision-making structures or already open data sets um, that could be put to further use than you know, their original intent. So um, that is kind of a very broad meta picture of what I'm working on now. And I think um, I'm gonna stop there because we'll get into um, some of the, the nuances of that during the questions. Perfect, fantastic. Uh, and Last but not least, I'm going to give the floor to Loic. So uh, maybe you can introduce a little bit yourself. Uh, and um, by now, I think you know the drill. Yes. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Loic Lannong. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. Uh, I'm now regretting having not made more effort on the outfit or the, or the background, uh, now that I have to describe it. So I'm, uh, I'm a white, uh, almost 30 year old uh, young man. I have a, a boring blue shirt and kind of a semi-boring uh, bookshelf in the background. 
Um, so I'm uh, calling from uh, Cambridge in the UK. Um, my So it's really interesting, lots of pressure talking now. I mean, such fascinating background described before. Uh, my background is in uh, statistics and machine learning mostly. That, so that's what I'm trained on. Uh, my PhD was initially on uh, kind of machine learning in biology. So looking at protein stuff, it's a bit boring. Uh, but um, early in 2020, so I was kind of in the middle of my uh, PhD, part of our lab is in Melbourne, Australia. So it's a partnership. And so we have a lot of colleagues there. And uh, you may remember that uh, at the start of 2020, there were uh, like some kind of horrible bushfires in Australia. Uh, back then, we thought it would be the defining feature of 2020. Uh, turned out not quite like that. But um, we had these um, horrendous pictures from, you know, colleagues, just pictures from outside their office where you could see it was basically dark red smoke everywhere. Uh, I guess uh, that might be a bit similar to what's happening uh, in Quebec now. And so we were receiving these pictures from places we have been or we had like kind of uh, been familiar with. And that prompted us really to wonder what the carbon footprint or what kind of what our role in all that was. Uh, so our lab does uh, genomic research mostly, so mostly computational biology. And so we, we wondered, okay, well, what's what's the environmental impact of what we're doing? And uh, back then it, really, it wasn't really a topic. You know, there's this big thing that if it's a computer, it has to be green. You know, computers are kind of the green way of going. So of course we, we thought we, we must be a lot better than wet labs or, you know, kind of experimental setup. Um, and I thought it would be a two weeks project. I was a bit tired doing my PhD research. So I thought, you know what, I'm gonna take a break and I'm gonna look into the carbon footprint of the lab. Uh, if I get, um, if I get a, a, a kind of a Twitter thread out of it, that, that will be great. Um, and I couldn't find anything. And that's how it started really. I was like, okay, so they, there's actually no way for me to calculate the carbon footprint of what I'm doing. Uh, there had been a handful of work in machine learning because it was the very start of large language models. Uh, and so, uh, you know, people who had to train models for weeks to get one result were starting to wonder, you know, maybe it isn't great. And so there they, they had been a, a little bit of work in the field of AI and natural language processing. Um, but outside of that, you know, really nothing. And I was like, okay, well, actually a large part of computational research is happening outside of machine learning. You know, it's, it's genetic research, it's physics, it's astrophysics, it's chemistry simulations, uh, nothing to do with machine learning. So we decided to build a calculator. Um, so it took a little bit more than two weeks. Uh, but basically we just put together this, uh, that's how this whole green algorithms initiative started. I'll, I'll just put a few links in the chat afterwards. Um, but we started working on this uh, online calculator that, you know, you just put a few parameters and it would tell you the carbon footprint. And, you know, as people have mentioned it before, it's, it's, it's quite a complicated things to estimate. Um, but what we wanted to do is to kind of give users some, some power to understand what their impact was rather than always relying on institutional level you know carbon report that no one really reads and you know you feel you can't do much about it um and and really we it, we thought no one would care it turned out people kind of cared a little bit and scientists were really interested a lot of them were like oh i was wondering what the impact of this model i've been running for two weeks was i just had no tools to do it um, and so that really started this this initiative, uh, which has been really interesting. Uh, and then we moved on to, you know, uh, making these tools more efficient or easier to use because of, you know, slightly different tools for different situations and then putting more guidelines in front of researchers. Uh, because a lot of the work that had been done on uh, computing efficiencies was mostly done on the side of data centers. So, you know, technical people would make data centers more efficient, which is needed. It's not going to be the whole solution. We can't really, you know, hope to bring Tech, like to hope that technology will solve a technological problem uh, alone. But um, so we really wanted to be on the side of researchers and say, okay, well, this is what you can contribute to and this is what you can change. Um, and that has been really the past uh, two years so, sort of things. You really trying to bring up the discussion amongst researchers, but also amongst institutions and funders and journals. Uh, so to raise awareness, for example, in, in our lab now, what we do is at the end of our publication, we uh, put some kind of uh, environmental impact statement. So we acknowledge carbon footprints, uh, the, the impact of the research presented as a way to raise awareness. Um, and we, we're trying to promote these kind of practices, um, which hopefully is, is going a, a long way. Uh, and it's, it's yeah, still a long way to go, but that's that's been uh, the work in progress. Uh, it's kind of timely. We had uh, just this very 
recently so i'll just plug that in as it might be of interest like just earlier this week we had like a we tried to come together with some principles on how to you know what computational science or computational research should look for in in the next few years uh i think i saw actually uh caitlin in the chat who um has been helping us editing it actually uh and so it's just out uh earlier this week and it's like greener because you know it's science so we have to find a good acronym so it was a lot of work figuring it's out figuring out something that would fit greener uh, and I'll, I'll put a link and basically it's just bringing together stakeholders and I will be really happy to discuss those or after if you have like some feedback on that that would be interesting is okay how can we make the field more sustainable moving forward and it will be really interesting to hear about uh, what everyone else here um, is doing on like around this field and I'll leave it on because I think we're running out of time. Fantastic thank you. Uh... Loic, and I'll give the word to Alejandro and then he can maybe get started with the question part. Yes, we thank you all you speaker for this amazing perspective. I guess uh, all of you are like doing fascinating work and your journey has been amazing, really like, wow. It's like very impressive having these perspectives around sustainability. So maybe it's something that I would like to start maybe with Shannon because I feel like we share common word in open environmental data science. In my case, is a kind of initiative done at the beginning for focused to help researchers to have and learn more how to share data. But I guess you mentioned something very relevant is not, no, 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 not only open data that that is that's the end of having this somewhere, but you mentioned the accessibility and the data usage usage of the data and as well you mentioned a very important point about community and empowering communities and be part more of this uh, decision making process so i uh, one one of the questions that i would like to frame you is what what challenge have you faced in the case of the u.s context that i wonder you are more familiar in developing this kind of idea to empower these community based data approaches so that's something if you want to elaborate more we appreciate it Sure, thank you. Um, and I'm actually going to drop a link. I um, fortuitously, this article that I, I just finished, um, and this is a fantastic anthology. Um, so I, I encourage everybody to take a look at all the articles in it. Uh, but this is really on this topic. Um, what are some of the challenges? Where are the, the places of opportunity? Um, and, you know, I, I, uh, I reflect on this quite a bit. Um, in, in the US, it's been very interesting with um, the um, the IRA and the American Rescues Plan, there's a lot of funding that has um, recently come into um, the space of uh, environment and climate and, you know, trying to figure out what we're going to do with an energy transition. Um, and I think one of the, uh, the, the challenges, um, you know, as I've been thinking about my own work and as I've seen, you know, kind of the, the broader landscape of new projects that are coming up um, is, there's still a, a continued and one of the other um, speakers for the chat said this, I think um, there's still a continued focus on technocentrism, um, you know, that we can solve all these problems, you know, first and foremost by creating digital and technical solutions. Um, and I think where that becomes a, a real challenge in, in my work is that um, you know, over the the years that I've been doing this, um, it's it's really quite a bit harder um, to do the cultural and the institutional shifts um, that are really necessary in uh, in ensuring that you know environmental data works, um, ensuring that you know our uh, our technical solutions don't just become part of the you know electronics pile um, that we we tend as humans to leave behind us. Um, you know, as we innovate and, uh, you know, put new research out into the world. And so, um, so I think that is, that continues this kind of, uh, you know, putting technology at the center of our solutions rather than humanity um, continues to be one of the biggest challenges. And then I would, I would also just say, um, you know, I've, I've been through uh, a lot of organizations and um, a, a lot of kind of different phases. Um, and, you know, doing this kind of solutions-based work right now, I I hope it continues to be really cool. 10 years, 50 years down the line, there's a lot of resources, a lot of thinking, a lot of people that are here for it. And I, I really want people to continue showing up for it. Um, but I also know that um, in all this work, we have ebbs and flows. Um, and so I, I think the other thing is 
um, being able, each of these projects, and I, I don't know all of you and I don't know where you're coming from, but um, for all of us to be prepared for um, when maybe environmental data or uh, climate solutions, um, you know, trend downwards. Um, so how do we keep people engaged and activated um, and keep this really on the top of policy um, and agenda setting? So um, those would be probably the, the two biggest challenges. And then, you know, again, um, if you want to read more or go more in depth, please take a look at the article um, and the, the larger anthology as well. Thank you, Chano, for bringing the perspective really like uh, this blog pod, I suggest everyone uh, have a look because it changed some perspective. Every time in, in at least in the UK, they are developing the call uh, new portals to make the open data more accessible. But I think the the users are very targeted only researchers and not communities. So there is a key message in the blog posts. And I guess now that you mentioned this cultural change, it's good to transition to Claire and something that I wonder and as well very uh, I know Julie's uh, Julie's bicycle is like promoting and having this advocacy in the art and, and culture uh, uh, sector to be more aware about the climate impact and, and the stuff that uh, they are uh, producing with events or different kind of uh, stuff that is in the creative uh, sector. But I would like to highlight that culture uh, is being in somehow no acknowledged in the policy arena. And I just want to mention this in recently in the COP27 culture was finally recognized as an asset to be protected from climate impacts and a resource to strengthen communities transformative change. So based on this discourse, I would like to ask you, Claire, what you see as a broader failure in approaches to addressing climate change and environmental issues so far, according to your perspective, that is gonna be very, very valuable. Why take so longer to the culture be recognized in the, this policy discussion globally about climate? So maybe you can elaborate more in that regards. Thank you, Claire. Whew. <laughs> That's uh, um, I, I think I think the kind of the key failure or the key issue is that we do not see ourselves as being parts of nature and that we have this extractive approach. We don't understand that we are a part of nature, that we depend on it for the air we breathe, for the food we eat. Um, and um, I think, you know, we people so often talk about saving the planet. And this is, um, you know, we're not saving the planet, I'll be honest. I think the planet will be fine if we weren't on it. Um, you know, we are, we are, we are saving ourselves. And I think that you know we have this fundamental problem of um, of seeing ourselves as separate from nature and and not being part of it. Um, I do think um, there is a failure in in the information and um, on the communication side, which is where the cultural and creative sector can do so much and is doing so much amazing work. Um, and you, you mentioned, you know, bringing the aesthetics into, um, into the communication of where we're at and what's happening. Um, I'll, I'll put some links in the chat, but there has been some um, recent research done on the power of artistic ways of interpreting data and engaging with people and how powerful that can be and how it can also kind of get away from, uh, you know, the politicization of, of the issues around climate change and, and biodiversity loss. Um, I, I, I think I would also say that um, there is a certain failure and it's something I've mentioned in the beginning and something we see a lot in that people do think data is the answer and having the footprints is the answer and it's not enough. We have done some small but really valuable pieces of work and research, which is, have really helped us to understand issues around digital impacts, around data. And, um, you know, we we know, like the question has come up that, you know, um, is it, you know, aviation is the biggest impact, but actually, um, yes, we know aviation has a big impact, but we do not understand 
very well the impact of digital and computing. We do know we've done some little pieces of work which show actually digital and physical and material impacts are roughly equal. And yes, flying usually blows the rest of it out of the water. But the problem is we have more and more data. We have more and more artificial intelligence, incredibly energy and carbon intensive activity. And we have all of this hardware, all of this mining and habitat destruction um, and chemical pollution, which is required to make it. And this billion tons of e-waste, which very often are, are um, in places which are deeply damaging to people and to people's health. Um, so, you know, we, we, have, we have, I think, really got to see that broader picture of understanding we need the data, but we also need to use that data and understanding to inform our decisions and to take action. Um, and I think that is really a failure at the moment. There is this absolute, yeah, let's get the footprint, let's do the calculations, but please, what are we going to do about it? And Shannon, I think, you know, the examples which you've given are amazing because that is true practical use of, of information and data and empowerment of people. Um, sorry, there's a lot. <laughs> I don't want to be too negative, um, but I think there's um, maybe. I guess the final, the final point is that you know there is there is a failure um, on on the policy level to understand what it takes to get good data and to have it as part of to inform good policy and to inform change. So. Lo many failures, <laughs> lots of good things too. But yeah, but but the, but it's really interesting because you 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 touch a lot about uh, the uh, that we need to think about the future, right? And and uh, how how having all this data and how having how are we going to use that data to change uh, to enact change in the future? So maybe that that's how I would like to uh, to focus the question to to our next speaker. So I'll ask. Uh, I'll reverse the order of the introduction. So I'll ask Loic first. Uh, maybe if you can share with us what, what do you think uh, that that future should lo look like? What changes are needed in in society and in in, in culture and in tech and in uh, um, e economic systems to to make the, this future a, a, a better place? How do you see that, Loic? Well, that's a big question. Um... Uh, no, uh, I'll focus mostly on the computing bit because uh, the other people on the panels were a lot better than me to talk about the rest. And that's kind of what I've been looking at. But um, I'll just go back on the, you know, the, the, the intuition that uh, has been mentioned a few times that, you know, aviation is probably the bigger part. And, you know, that's what you think initially. You're like, well, surely computers can't be as bad as, comp as planes. And it mostly isn't. But uh, we did a few re a bit of research and we found, you know, some kind of genetic studies, large scale genetic studies. And uh, for context, doing it once is the same as flying to Paris for breakfast and back every morning for six months. Um, or, you know, one of these large scale um, protein structure prediction is like 50 flight between New York and Melbourne in Australia. Um, so with this large compute, we can actually reach levels of impact that, you know, exceeds field work in some cases, which I find, well, a bit de depressing, but also, you know, kind of highlight how important it is to tackle that. And I completely agree with what people have said before that, you know, we can't rely on technological solutions to a technological problem. Uh, we will need some of it. We will need better, more sustainable data centers. We will need like the technology to keep improving, but it will only result in, in improvements and reduction of carbon footprints and improvement for for societies in general if we also go with cultural change and uh, that's something where we really need to involve everyone i saw someone in the chat putting that you know it's important to include it in students and uh, in education and that's absolutely key is that actually as part of scientists or as part of researchers training who learn about these cool new models also including the downsides of it and how to deal with that uh, and I think that's that's starting to be done, and there are more and more PhD programs that include modules modules on sustainability. I know we've got a few in Cambridge, for example, but mostly by like luck of the draw, like a program director who is keen to do it, and that just happens one year. Um, more broadly, 
we well we just need to acknowledge the the environmental cost at the core of of how we assess research especially computational research uh we've been trying to promote these kind of environmental impact statements uh where you know when applying for grants or when being published in journals uh saying acknowledging the carbon footprint of the of the research proposed and uh it's not because things have downsides that we don't fund research anymore. You know, research costs money. It's not because it costs money that we don't do it. Uh, it's not because there are ethical challenges that we don't do animal research anymore. It just need, it just means we are a bit more mindful about the kind of research we do. And if you apply for a grant saying you need to do animal research or you need to do human clinical trials, you need to spend a bit of time explaining why you think it is really needed and why you think the potential benefits will outweigh the costs. Um, and I think for computing in particular, and that's quite different from other aspects of sustainability, we have so many low hanging fruits. Well, like some other aspects have been working on it for a bit longer. So kind of the low hanging fruits have been tackled, but like for computing, it isn't because for a long time it was just free. And so I think we, we there's quite a lot we can do as individual scientists, but also we need this kind of institutional funding bodies, journals, engagement to put kind of pressure from both ends uh, on the problem. And I think really, if we accept that computing has a real cost, uh, environmental cost, and if we want to just make sure the benefits like remain, uh, we need to acknowledge those and you know really educate people on how they can tackle it. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Loic. Uh, in, in view of the time, I'm just going to uh, give the word to Alejandro so we can do like a quick round of closing statements. So, Did Anna well, wanted to jump on? Did yes. Anna wanted to yeah. jump on? I, I can fold my comments into something small at the end. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, basically, we just have uh, some minutes left. Um, basically, I would like all the speakers and just very brief sentence, think like where, where would you be in terms of computation, climate or culture in 50 years time, where, where you see, uh, you can answer it very concisely, please. Any volunteer? Anne, maybe you? Sure, sure. So I, in addition to all the excellent points that have been raised today, that I think are really good North Stars for the future, I'll, I'll just add two things. Uh, one is that I don't think we will succeed if we present this as solely an environmental issue. I think we need to constantly emphasize how this is a question of uh, our labor, right? The quality of the work that we do as researchers and who gets to be in the room with us. Um, and I also think that we won't succeed if this is a question of what we're giving up, right? Um, so I think we need a kind of affirmative politics of the pleasures that we could find in finding more convivial ways of working. Um, that you know uh, tie into all those questions and and emphasize what we have to win rather than what we're giving up. So I imagine a kind of degrowth vision for uh, academic research and research beyond the academy, where we all get to have a little more conviviality um, and a little less carbon. Great, I guess degrowth is a key word. Very, I still I still very well discuss it in many places around the world, including my home country, Colombia, a lot of controversy. But now, Shannon, maybe because you need to go and you won't be in the QA, it's your time that you put your words as well here. Yeah, I, um, and maybe it's it's actually just kind of to back up on Anne's comment a bit is I, I think a, a lot of um, the, the work that we're seeing is still um, very deeply built into, you know, especially in the United States, a, a lot of modes of capitalist production and behavior. Um, and I really, if we're going to, um, if we're going to solve this, you know, my key point would be we need to rethink these kind of competitive landscapes um, and figure out how we can do better cooperation and collaboration together. Um, especially, you know, if this is a, a group that is thinking about open practices and the tools of open, um, that is that is a primary form um, of how we. Uh, are, should be, should continue to be operating. Um, and really, I think that will, you know, uh, help us drive towards what I'm very interested in is that truly participatory um, environmental governance. Perfect. Thank you, Shannon. Um, thank you for joining anyway. We know that you have a very tight agenda, but thank you for participating. Now, uh, Claire, uh, what did you see in 50 years? Uh, and in terms of any, did you want to? 
Yeah, being yeah. Repetitive, yeah. I, I think, um, you know, um, very much thinking about these worlds of computation and culture coming together. I think what we really need to say, see is that both these worlds of computation and culture are in practice, are ethical, are zero carbon, are nature positive and regenerative in practice, and that they're both really connected together to inform and evidence um, better change and, and a better tomorrow. So really working hand in hand, but the practice has got to go with the content. Everything, nice vision. And uh, I guess uh, we ended with uh, Loe. Loe, you want to say something with seeing the 50 years, maybe combining all this uh, culture and computation. Yeah, I'll yes. go very quick because of time and, and you know, People have said everything. Uh, I would hope that in 50 years we have figured a way that maybe not from production, but at least we figured a way to make computer running with very limited impact on the environment. Like we've got the technology to make data centers have very low operational impact. I'm not saying we'll be able to build computers that have no impact, but I would hope that by that point we can, you know, dedicate effort to addressing all the other aspects of society that have terrible impact, but that at least running computations won't be quite as bad as as it is today. Uh, but that's maybe a bit naive, but let's let's end up on something hopeful, maybe. Thank you, Loe. I, I guess, and uh, you are in, like, we have, <laughs> we're passing already over the hour, but in my case, my vision in 50 years is I really like, I agree with Claire, like having this culture and computation and really having this, cult as we have COVID, that made certain cultural radical change in our daily life. I, I, I will need another COVID, but I think we need something like made this disruptive change and thinking more in the, this cultural change and how we are reflecting in our environmental footprint and how can we be more collaborative and be more transparent in where we are doing this kind of uh, like from local, personal to more like community that we're part all this environmental impact. So I, 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 I my, my vision is to have in a, a great future where culture is definitely part of this, uh, this vision, this vision, not just technological development, but some more cultural changes. That's me. And Carlos? I'm, I'm, I just have to agree with everybody because uh, it, I'm, I'm, I'm really mostly learning about this, this new world. I find it super in, uh, interesting and super fascinating. Uh, so uh, yes, I think I think we need to find how to make uh, computing and, and culture different in a way that we can make it more sustainable in the long term. Um, but then I'm very uh, wary about the time and I you know Anne wanted to keep it strict to the one hour. So I'll just keep back the floor to her. I'll add myself in here. Thank you all so much um, for, for joining. Um, thank you so much for also telling us more about what brought you here. Um, I will flag to everyone here in the audience that we will be turning off the recording here to really start um, our kind of unrecorded Q&A part of today's session, which means that we'll be unpinning all of our videos, um, turning off the recording and really inviting you all to ask questions that you might have of each other, um, of the speakers, um, more around these topics, but we really thank you so much for tuning in and we hope you'll join us for our next Fireside Chat um, in a few months time. Thank you all so much and I will turn off the recording here. <laughs>